So how is hypertension treated? The first line of defense is lifestyle changes, which is what we mentioned in it as far as prevention in the previous video. Eating healthy foods, lowering salt intake, and all these different things. We, we want to make sure that we live a healthy life so that we don't have to necessarily deal with hypertension. And if we do have to deal with hypertension, these lifestyle changes can still be a form of treatment and they can help to reduce um, issues with hypertension and they can actually lower the hypertension. Now, um, why, why is it we want lifestyle changes before we think about medications? Why is lifestyle changes or why are they the first line of defense? The reason why is because drugs have these things called side effects and they can be bad and harmful for patients. So the best thing to do is make it so that we don't have to take drugs, don't have to take medications. That's the ideal. But if there are, medications are the sort of the second line of defense. So the kind of drugs that are used to treat hypertension are antihypertensive drugs. So these are, these drugs are not for people with prehypertension. They are only for patients who do indeed have hypertension and it is not controlled just by lifestyle changes. The prescription uh, drugs that are that are given to a patient, what is prescribed is based on a variety of things and it can include um, age or even existing medical conditions that they already have. And what's best for them. As far as um, combinations of drugs, combinations of different antihypertensive drugs are possible and actually common for many patients. I do want to you to recall that this idea of blood pressure equaling the stroke volume times the heart rate times the resistance, not equaling necessarily, but um, being related to those values. So if we can reduce reduce any of these values to lower blood pressure, that's what these drugs are going to want to do. So when it comes to the classifying the drugs of, that treat hypertension, we usually think about the A, B, C, Ds of hypertension drug classes. A stands for ACE inhibitors. Uh, and ACE inhibitors are, of course, angiotensin convertase or converting enzyme inhibitors. And oftentimes, these drugs, their names will end in PRIL. So if you see a drug name that ends in PRIL, it's probably an ACE inhibitor. Not necessarily, but it's probably. Um, so what, what exactly is the function of these drugs? What's the function of the ACE inhibitor? The function is to block angiotensin converting enzyme activity. So basically what that, what that does is angiotensin converting enzyme, what that does is that turns angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. So that would happen, that wouldn't happen, or if it did happen, it would happen much less often. So we'd have no angiotensin 2 created from angiotensin 1, or at least we would have less angiotensin 2 created from angiotensin 1. So what are the effects of, of blocking that angiotensin convertase, converting enzyme activity? Well, we either have no um, sympathetic activation, or we'd have less of it. So we'd have no increase. Let me put this in red here. Actually, let's do blue. We would have no increase in sympathetic activity. So if there's no increase in sympathetic activity, that means we'd have a lower stroke volume and a lower heart rate, and thus a lower blood pressure. Another thing we'd have no or less of is we'd have no vasoconstriction or less vasoconstriction, which would mean that we'd have less resistance. Again, lower blood pressure. If we have no sodium or water retention, then we would have... Uh, a lower blood volume, and a lower blood volume means a lower stroke volume. If we have no antidiuretic hormone, or um, or less antidiuretic hormone, or no water retention, or less water retention, again, that would decrease the stroke volume. No aldosterone secretion, again, decrease the stroke volume. All of these effects decrease the blood pressure. Another thing that classified under A is angiotensin II receptor blockers which are abbreviated as ARBs, so sometimes they're called ARBs. These are often end in uh, sartan. So if you see a drug name that ends in sartan, it's probably an angiotensin II receptor blocker. And what these things do is they block 
the effects of angiotensin II by uh, blocking the binding. They block the binding of angiotensin II on cell receptors. So what are the effects here? Well, they're basically the same as the above, right? They are going to stop the effects of angiotensin II, which are all these effects here. So, but why would angiotensin II receptor blockers be prescribed over angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors? Well, the simple sort of reply is that but there are perhaps adverse side effects from ACE inhibitors. So if a patient is prescribed ACE inhibitors, they happen to have negative side effects, an angiotensin II receptor blocker might be considered. Next up is B, C, and D. So B stands for beta blockers. And these beta blockers, they block the binding of epinephrine and norepinephrine at beta adrenergic receptors. So basically what that does is that reduces sympathetic activity. So if there's if epinephrine and norepinephrine, which are part of the sympathetic nervous system, if they're not active, they're not being able to exert their effects, we're going to have less sympathetic activity. Beta blockers often end in olol. O L O L. So if you see a name that ends in OLOL, -L, might be a beta blocker. So if we have no or less sympathetic activity, then what we have is we have um, no increased contractility of the heart, and thus we have a lower stroke volume. Lower stroke volume, lower blood pressure. We also would have no, uh, no increase in heart rate, so we'd have a lower heart rate, which again would give us a lower blood pressure. So that's how beta blockers work. What about C, calcium channel blockers, or CCBs. So calcium channel blockers often end in peen or pine. I'm not exactly sure how that would be pronounced. But what these do is they block the flow of calcium through calcium ion channels. And what that does is that stops um, that basically makes it so that uh, we have no muscle contractions. So calcium ions are required to, to flow into a cell to cause muscle cell contractions. So if we have smooth muscle in the blood or, or cardiac muscle in the heart, um, those things cannot contract. So what we have is we have less vasoconstriction, which means that the, the vessels themselves could stay dilated that would be less resistance and a lower blood pressure. In the heart, we would have a lower contractile force and lower electrical activity just in general. And those would both lead to a lower stroke volume and a lower heart rate, which of course, all these go, again, to decrease blood pressure. D, or di for diuretics, these things often end in zide, or at least ide. Let's just go with ide. What these things do, what diuretics do, is they increase the production and excretion of urine. So basically, what they do is they eliminate water and salt, or sodium. So if we lose water, we have less water, we have a smaller blood volume, smaller blood volume, lower stroke volume, lower blood pressure. So all of these things have different ways of lowering blood pressure, but it always comes back down to decreasing either the stroke volume, heart rate, or resistance. There are some other um, drugs, including alpha blockers, renin inhibitors, aldosterone receptor antagonists, vasodilators, alpha-2 agonists, and endothelial receptor blockers. They all are also used to treat hypertension, but they're not as common as the ones mentioned above. Hope that video was helpful. Thank you for watching.